I first heard about a community forest at the U.S. Forest Service workshop at the Land Trust Alliance Rally in Denver in 2010. Brought that idea back to the Nisqually watershed in my role as executive director of the Nisqually Land Trust. And then we worked with the National Park Service to set up a watershed-wide conversation about what might a community forest look like in the Nisqually watershed. Where would it be located? What would it do? Who would participate in it? We're located right here along the Nisqually River at Frank's Landing. The Wahilud Indian School behind us, you can hear the kids enjoying recess today. My grandfather used to say that there used to be so many fish in the river that you could walk across their backs. And I think about that a lot, you know, and I hope we can get back to paradise on the Nisqually. Being a good steward and good partnerships, that definitely helps. One of our former council members, who's actually my cousin, is one of our master weavers. And he talked about how everything weaves together like a basket. And when you think about everything from the summit to the sea, it all ties together. And that's the community forest. It all ties into the big picture of what the Nisqually tribe is doing. And that is protecting all of the resources up and down this river. They're the lead entity for salmon recovery. They were one of the ones that identified some of the issues that were ongoing for steelhead in particular, and also Chinook. The Nisqually Community Forest is really a story of partnerships. One of those great partnerships is with the Nisqually tribe. They helped us with the initial funding to get the forest, and along with that, we helped purchase their first commercial forest land. So they have 1,200 acres that abuts the community forest, and we plan to manage those together. We're up here at 4,500 feet elevation, right in the headwaters where every drop of rain and every bit of melting snow, that water then flows downhill and becomes the Nisqually River and these areas that are so critical to salmon. And it all starts with how this landscape is managed and whether you have conditions that are not favorable for salmon flowing downriver or conditions that have cold, clean water. When we've done our recovery plans to bring salmon back, both as a region and locally, initially, a lot of the work around forest management was to prevent the future conversion of forests into things like housing or parking. And all of that made a lot of sense because once you pay the forest, you can't get it back. But what we're learning now is that just having the forest isn't good enough. We have to manage it in a way that promotes healthy watersheds. And the current rules and regulations are not progressive enough to do that. And that's really what we're trying to do with the community forest from its inception as just an idea and a question about whether or not this is something we should do to now. I'm actually amazed at how many acres we've been able to acquire and the quality of the management plan that we have and the fact that we are getting these really positive environmental outcomes in addition to being able to send truckloads full of logs to the local mills and employ local loggers. Prior to the acquisition of this land by Nisqually Community Forest, it was an industrial plantation. So the trees were replanted really densely and a lot of natural ingrowth happened. So the main thing the forest needs and what we've been doing now is thinning to remove the smaller and less healthy trees so that the remaining trees have more room to grow and they can get larger and create more habitat that way. The style of forest management that we're doing here differs from the traditional industrial forestry. By thinning it, you can get some revenue now and you can get more revenue sooner. Within 10 or 20 years, you can come back and do another thinning and it's still forest. It's still cooling the waters, it's still visible from the highway for people going up to Mount Rainier, it's still usable by skiers and by mountain bikers. There's a lot of value in having that forest beyond just the lumber. It's really neat to be able to work with Nisqually Community Forest because they are balancing the local economy and creating jobs and creating wood products with things like recreation and habitat. They're doing that in a really interesting way. I'm involved with the Mount Tahoma Trail Association, which has a cabin in the community forest. It's the largest non-motorized trail system that's free in North America. I believe that the community forest's mission of long-term growing an older forest and a more diverse forest is really well accepted by the kind of users at Mount Tahoma Trails. I like the idea of local ownership, local business, local mills harvesting. 
the community forest does care. The community forest is not going away and I would love to see the community forest grow. The community forest represents hope and optimism. You don't go into a project like this unless you feel good about it, unless you feel like you can get there, no matter what the odds are. So much of what we're doing here is looking for ways to address climate change at a local level, to feel like you really can do something. These are inspiring things. These are things we need to do, and I see that continuing well into the future.